I think iced coffee might be my favorite drink ever, but especially coming out of a little skeleton glass. Look how cute my glass is. Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, this is What a Ghoul Wants, and my name is Anna. I'm trying to switch up the intro a little bit, maybe do something a little bit more relaxed. So I'm super excited for the topic today, everybody. I love talking about horror movies, obviously. That's why I created this channel. But especially horror movies that I would consider some of my favorite. And today I'm going to be talking about my favorite scenes in horror ever. Now this is kind of loosely inspired by, I don't know if anyone else watched this. It was on TV in the early to mid 2000s on Bravo, and it was Bravo's 100 Scariest Movie Moments. Presenting the 100 Scariest Movie Moments, a countdown of the greatest moments of cinema shot. If you remember this show, please comment below and let me know because I was obsessed with this. Anytime it was on, my eyes would be glued to the screen and I would want to watch all the way from 100 to 1, which I think it was like, I don't know, maybe three hours worth of television total. They broke it up into maybe like segments of 33 for each hour. I can't remember exactly, but I actually watched it on YouTube not too long ago because I wanted to get a little bit of nostalgia and also be reminded of what they included on that list. So I watched it on YouTube and it got me thinking that I should probably make my own top 10 horror movie moments. And what I'll be talking about today is not what I consider the scariest movie moments. Maybe I'll do a separate video for that, although I feel like scares are so subjective and it's different for every person. So I guess I could do what I personally find scary, which it's a little hard for me to be genuinely scared by a movie these days. But yeah, I might make a separate video for my top 10 scariest movie moments. But today we're just going to be talking about my favorite horror movie moments in general. So these are just moments in horror movies that I have really gravitated to over the years that I come back to or when I watch these movies, they're the scenes that I look forward to the most or get the most out of when I'm watching the film. So that's kind of the basis for the list today. And I would love to hear what everyone else's favorite horror movie moments are in the comments. Please comment below and let me know. And if it does happen to contain spoilers, uh, just add that at the top of your comment just to let everybody know in case they haven't seen the movie that you're talking about. But that being said, today there are probably going to be some spoilers in this video. So if I do mention a movie that you haven't seen yet and you want to avoid spoilers for it, I would just skip to the next movie on the list because there are going to be some things I talk about that do kind of spoil certain movies. So just be aware of that. So I'm going to go ahead and jump on in and I'm going to start with my number 10. And my number 10 favorite horror movie moment is from Misery. And if you've seen Misery, there is one scene that kind of lives in infamy from that movie, and that is the scene that I picked, and that is the hobbling scene. Now, this is one that has stuck in my mind ever since I saw it. I think I watched it maybe on TV for the first time or just caught part of the movie and came in and was like, what's going on? And after seeing that scene, which I guess they must have been able to show it. I don't know what I was watching it on, if they can show that part on cable. But yeah, if you've seen this movie, you know. We've got our lead, Paul Sheldon, and he is in bed. He is incapacitated by Annie Wilkes, his super fan, who is trying to nurse him back to health after a car accident, which turns out she does not have any plans to let him go. She is basically just keeping him hostage to write the next book in the series that she is obsessed with. So we get this scene where I think he had tried to escape earlier in the film. I'm trying to remember exactly. Think, think, think. Hold on, let me consult my notes <laughs> real quick. Okay, yeah, so he's been sneaking out of his room and she wants to make sure that he can't do that. So she straps him down to the bed puts a block of wood between his legs, and she's got that sledgehammer, and you just know what's coming is gonna be terrible. And Kathy Bates does such an incredible job. Number one, just portraying the character of Annie Wilkes. Like, she is so good at 
being kind of like innocent and just coming across as pretty harmless. Like you just think at first that she's a person who really wants to help out Paul Sheldon. And then you see it turn and she has these moments of the rage coming out and you can see the person underneath where she is this unhinged person. He didn't get out of the cock a duty car! And in this scene, it's just so perfectly played by her because in her mind, it's what she has to do. She's like, well, I got to make sure he can't leave. This is the logical next step. I just have to do it for the sake of, you know, Paul's own good. And we see her face when she puts that sledgehammer up by her face. And she just looks so cold and so ruthless. And then you get the swing. Yes. Hey, please. And it hits his foot and it goes completely sideways. I don't know if I can actually show it on here. If you've seen the movie, obviously you know what I'm talking about. But I mean, you can just imagine it in your mind uh, if you haven't seen it. Gosh, it's so memorable and his scream. And in your own head, you kind of make up seeing the other foot go. But really, we only see her hit one of his feet. It's all in the filmmaking and the editing. Almost done. Rob Reiner does an amazing job directing this movie, and this scene stands out as a moment of brutality that you just don't think is coming. And we get even more later in the film, which I think it's something that if you haven't read the book, you might not necessarily think that there's going to be a lot of gore or moments like this where it's some pretty intense body horror, and we get that in Misery. And I know in the book, I haven't read the book, but I do know that the scene in the book is even more insane. It involves an ax and a blowtorch for cauterization. I don't even, I don't know if that's a word. Uh, <laughs> purposes. So I don't know if they just either didn't have the budget in this movie to do that or they thought it would be possibly more effective or just fit into the story better to have it just be the hammer. But I still think it's an incredibly effective scene. The special effects work in it are amazing. It looks like a real foot for sure. So yeah, the hobbling scene in Misery is my number 10. God, I love you. Number nine is from Jennifer's Body. If you follow my channel, you'll know I've talked about this movie quite a bit before. And it's just one that I keep going back to because it's such an enjoyable watch. And a big part of that is the dialogue that happens between Jennifer and Needy and the rest of the teens. I think that Diablo Cody just writes such compelling dialogue. You're a jerk. Wow, nice insult, Hannah Montana. You got any more horse digs? It's so quippy and witty, and I love that about the film. It's what adds to the rewatchability factor for me. And I think that it's why the movie has gained such a cult following. It's so quotable, and there are so many lines where if you say this line, you know exactly what it's from. And one of those lines is one of the most quoted from the movie. It's the pool scene, and we're getting Jennifer and Needy kind of finally having it out. They've had problems the whole movie, and obviously a lot of them have to do with Jennifer being a succubus who was killing boys, but she crosses the line when she goes after Needy's boyfriend, Chip. It's, first of all, it's such an interesting setting for a scene in a horror movie. There are actually a lot of pool scenes in horror movies, but a lot of the times they're in just, you know, normal looking pools, just clean, well-kempt, you know, a normal pool. But this one is like this dilapidated, building. I don't know if it was like rec center or I can't remember if it was like part of the school or something like that. But regardless, it's just grimy and gross and dirty. And you've got graffiti and the word hopeless is written in the background, which is a callback to when Jennifer is talking to one of her victims, she says that she needs them hopeless. I need you hopeless. So it's just reiterating that this is what's happening, that Jennifer is going to keep doing what she's doing and Needy is losing hope. Like her boyfriend is literally dying in front of her eyes. 
So we get the part where they're kind of quipping back and forth. And this has actually become a uh, TikTok trend where people will lip sync to this part of the movie where Needy is saying that Jennifer is insecure and Jennifer saying that how could she be insecure? She was the snowflake queen. I am not insecure, Needy. God, that's a joke. How could I ever be insecure? I was the snowflake queen and all of that. So that gets quoted on TikTok actually, which I think is really cool that um, younger generations have kind of latched on to the dialogue in the movie. But then we get the iconic line where Jennifer is saying that she is going to eat her soul and shit it out. And Needy is like, I thought you only murdered boys. And Jennifer says, I thought you only murdered boys. I go both ways. I go both ways, which it's interesting. Obviously, she is talking about killing in this scene, but the killing in this movie is kind of a metaphor for sexual appetite. And we obviously get the scene earlier where her and Needy are kissing. So we know that she's not just talking about killing, that she is talking about her sexuality. So we get a straight up just admission of bisexuality from Jennifer. And a lot of people in the queer community have really gravitated towards this scene and Jennifer Check as a character. She has just become this bisexual icon and I love her for that. And I love that this is something that we have in a horror movie where it's coming from a character who is technically the villain of the movie, but we really honestly root for Jennifer in this whole movie. She is the person that we are identifying with mostly and who we just love to watch. We love watching Megan Fox and we love watching Jennifer Jennifer just go around and be confident, killing boys, just doing whatever she wants. I know Jennifer's Body is not a lot of people's favorite movie, and a lot of people do have issues with the film, but I love that it's being reclaimed as a cult classic, and I will just never ever get tired of watching this scene. <laughs> I love seeing Amanda Seyfried and Megan Fox act together. They just balance each other out so well, and their line deliveries are perfect. Just, yeah, everything about it, I love it. So the I go both ways scene from Jennifer's Body is my number nine. Tampon. Number eight is from The Sixth Sense. And honestly, there are a lot of scenes in this movie that I could have picked because so many of them are iconic and so memorable for horror fans. But the one that I chose for this list is where little Haley Joel Osment is in his house and he's made his little blanket fort thing, his little safe space. And it's nighttime and he knows that there's a ghost around. He is frantically trying to get into his safe space. He closes the little opening to his tent and it just pans up and we see the clothespins that are holding the blanket up coming apart. And the pacing in this scene is so good. I really admire M. Night Shyamalan's patience with this whole scene and he's just giving the scene the space to breathe and for the audience to take in what's happening and for the dread to build. And we see little Cole looking so scared. We see his breath. We know that it's really cold in the room, which is evidence that there's a ghost there. And we're just waiting to see if we see the presence. Will we see it? And we cut over and we see sickly Misha Barton with that gross puke coming out of her mouth. <laughs> just looking so scary. And on a first watch, we don't realize what's happening. We don't know why she's there, what's happening with her. So when you first see it, you're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? She's so scary. Why is she doing this to him? Why is she freaking him out? When on a rewatch, we know that she is reaching out to him for help and we realize the reason behind why she is appearing the way that she is and we feel so sorry for her. So first of all, there's the genius of Shyamalan and the way that the story is written to where on the rewatch you can pick apart these scenes and really realize what's happening in the context of knowing that the ghosts aren't bad. They are reaching out to Cole for help because they know that he is the only one who can perceive them. But when you first see the scene, it is so scary. 
And when the whole blanket fort collapses and you just see the blanket over her and that her shape is holding up the blanket, that is such a creepy image. And little Cole is so scared. And Haley Joel Osment's acting is so good. As far as child actors go, he is phenomenal. He just really sells the part. Do you want to tell me something? And this scene is honestly, it could be shown to film students of like how to build suspense in a scene because it's just phenomenal. I, I can't say enough good things about this scene and about this movie. I haven't seen all of M. Night Shyamalan's filmography, but this probably is my favorite of the ones I have seen. It stays as a horror classic for a good reason. It's just a really good film and very suspenseful, very effective, and it scares. This scene is honestly one of the most memorable horror movie moments ever, in my opinion, which is why I absolutely had to put it on my list. <laughs> I'm feeling much better now. Okay, on to number seven. And this is the most recent horror movie on my list. And the scene is from The Invisible Man from 2020. So this one is definitely going to contain a spoiler if you haven't seen this movie. I would highly suggest that you watch it. It's phenomenal. It's so good. So in The Invisible Man, we have Elizabeth Moss who is escaping an abusive relationship with her partner who is a very wealthy tech genius who has invented this technology that can literally render you invisible. So he is the invisible man and she is trying to escape him, escape his memory at first, but then literally escape escape from him because he is basically trying to make her appear crazy to everybody around her so that she has no one to turn to. And we get this scene that's set in a restaurant. This is after she goes to his house and finds out about the technology. So at first she doesn't know about it, but then she goes and she actually sees the suit that he uses. And she realizes that he is the one who's doing all of these things to make her seem like she's going crazy. So she's in this crowded restaurant with her sister, who we know throughout the film they've had kind of a contentious relationship. And her sister is pretty skeptical about what's going on, but they meet at this restaurant so they can kind of talk everything over. And this is where Elizabeth Moss is planning on telling her sister what she knows about her ex. I found something that can prove what I'm experiencing. That can prove that Adrian is stalking me. What is that? And just as she is about to tell her, we see a knife floating in the air and it cuts her sister's throat and then flies into her hand. I somehow, what? It happens so quickly, you're not expecting it at all. I think when I first saw this movie, I gasped when it happened. And you know, they're in this crowded restaurant. Elizabeth Moss's character, Cecilia, thinks that she's safe here. She thinks that nothing can happen while they're amongst all these people because her ex, Adrian, isn't going to risk people catching on to what he's doing or starting to potentially believe her when she says that these things are happening, things that seem like they would be impossible. So she thinks that she's gonna be safe in this crowded restaurant with a bunch of witnesses, but what ends up happening is no one sees the split second where her sister is killed. All they see is Cecilia sitting there with a knife and then her sister across the table from her slumped over bleeding. So of course, everyone's going to think that she's the one who did it. And Elizabeth Moss's acting in this scene is just incredible. I mean, I don't need to tell you guys she's an amazing actress, but in this scene, she's got a combination of the nerves of telling her sister what's happening because she doesn't think she's going to be believed, but also kind of the excitement of getting it off her chest. And then you see in this moment where she's holding the knife, everything drains and she realizes what's happening. Where she's like, oh my gosh, my ex Adrian just killed my sister. And there is absolutely no way to convince other people that I didn't do it because I'm sitting here with this knife. And there's no other explanation. And that's such a brilliant scene to have in a movie because then you're like, well, how is she going to get out of this? No one is going to believe her. There's no evidence. And she's just going to be stuck in jail because of this. And she's going to be charged with murdering her own sister. So it's honestly, it's such a perfect scene in my opinion. And it comes at such 
a perfect time in the film. And it's so unexpected. But then when you rewatch it and you know what's happening, you're kind of looking forward to it. You're like, oh gosh, it's coming, it's coming. And it kind of drags on when you are waiting, you know, like the waiter comes over and he's pouring them water and you're just like, oh gosh, it's coming up. So I honestly think that The Invisible Man is one of the best horror movies to come out in the past 10 years. And a lot of that is a testament to Elizabeth Moss and her acting. But credit also absolutely goes to Lee Winnell, the director and the writers of the film. And adding the scene in, I think, was really a game changer in the movie and it really just raised the stakes even more so yeah the restaurant scene in the invisible man hands down had to make my list do you guys need more time with the drink yes lots more time number six is from alien this is another one where when i mentioned this movie you guys can probably guess what scene i'm going to talk about but this is just one of the best horror sci-fi movies of all time we've got the amazing sigourney weaver and she absolutely kills it she is one of the strongest women in horror the strongest characters this first movie is just expertly directed by ridley scott he does an incredible job directing and that is perfectly illustrated in this scene it's the chest burster scene, of course. <laughs> I knew it! This scene is well known for a reason. It's a scene where you realize the threat that really comes with denying safety protocol of coming back onto the spaceship when quarantine is not properly done. Something very familiar about all this. And this is at the behest of Sigourney Reaver's character, Ellen Ripley. She is insisting that they cannot let someone in because he has been contaminated by being on this other planet and encountering this alien. They break protocol, he comes in, and we get a scene where the whole crew is just chilling, sitting, eating, just talking, shooting the shit. Very realistic scene. Everybody is very relaxed. It's very much like realism happening. And out of nowhere, we get the, the guy who broke quarantine. He starts struggling and they're like, whoa, what's going on? What's happening? And of course we get him kind of seizing and then bam. That alien just comes straight out of his chest and the blood that spurts out, it gets on everybody. Everyone starts freaking out and they realize, oh my God, we made a huge mistake. Ripley was right. We shouldn't have let him back on. Now the whole ship is compromised. And it just shows just what these aliens are capable of. Like they will literally live inside the human body and use it as a host and then kill them as they are birthed or, you know, exit their body. So first of all, such an interesting concept for a monster in a movie, having them use a human as a host and just the whole life cycle of the xenomorph is so interesting from the face hugger to the chest burster to the queen alien. And the scene just lets us know that they cannot be messing around with this alien species. So yeah, Ridley Scott's pacing in this moment and the abruptness of the alien coming out of his body, just everything about it. It's the reason why people still talk about the scene today where on a first viewing when you have no idea what's coming, it's just so epic and it's so surprising that it just sticks in your mind like you you can't forget this scene. So that's why I just had to include the chest burster scene on my list. Wait a minute. If we let it in, the ship could be infected. You know the quarantine procedure. Number five on my list is from Scream. You could pick many, many moments from Scream, from the opening scene, which is arguably one of the most iconic opening scenes in horror ever, to the killer reveal, to Randy talking about his rules for horror movies. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. Honestly, the movie is full of memorable scenes and scenes that we continue to talk about to this day. 
But one of my favorite scenes ever has to do specifically with our final girl, Sydney. Sydney Prescott, played by Nev Campbell, is a lot of people's favorite final girl, and for good reason. We've seen her in now five movies, and the whole time she is just kicking ass and taking names, and she's a normal girl. She's a normal high school girl in the first movie, and it progresses throughout her life through the sequels, but she is someone who has been through so much in her life. Life, that you are rooting for her in every movie. You want Sydney to overcome all the obstacles that she faces. And especially in the first one, when she's dealing with the death of her mother, not just the death, but the tragic and horrible murder of her mother. And she makes it through this whole movie, avoiding the killer and seeing her friends die before her eyes. She literally has trauma upon trauma upon trauma. And we get to the very end where we know that the reveal of the killers being Billy and Stu. Mm. Corn syrup. Same stuff they use for pig's blood and carry. Surprise, Sydney. Billy being her boyfriend, the person that she is supposed to be leaning on the most when she is having hard times in her life. And he is the one who is orchestrating this whole thing. And she finds out that he killed her mom. Like, this is just the worst thing to ever happen to any person ever. So we're at the very end and we think that Billy is dead. He's laying on the ground. He's bloody. And I believe it's actually Gail who shoots him initially. But we get Randy saying that the killer always comes back for one last scare. Careful. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. Billy is laying on the ground and he pops up and Randy and Gail scream, but Sydney does not miss a beat. She takes the gun that's in her hand and she shoots Billy in the head. Not in my movie. And we get her uttering the iconic line, not in my movie. It's just such a display of strength on Sydney's part, like the strength to kill her boyfriend, the person that she loved, the person that she thought was on her side. It's just a testament to Sydney, and she knows what she has to do and she kills him and she's the one to do it. She takes control and she's saying like, not in my movie, not in her life. Like she is not gonna let this happen. So that is just such a badass moment. And we love the one-liners in Scream. There are a lot of great lines, but the fact that Sydney also delivers lines like this is just so cool. She has a lot of personality and we see her being snarky with the killers. And this is just her last little jab at Billy. And she's like, I'm the one that's gonna come out on top and you're not gonna mess with me anymore. So I had to have something from Scream on this list and I honestly could have done almost any scene from the movie, but that one just holds a special place in my heart because Sydney displays the ultimate final girl energy in this last scene where she delivers that line. So I had to put that one on my list. I'll send you a copy. <clears throat> oh! Number four is from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And if you know me, I usually cite the Texas Chainsaw Massacre as my favorite horror movie, although, you know, it fluctuates, it kind of changes, but that one is always in my top four. Again, this is another movie where there are several scenes that I could include on this list. But the one that I included is the dolly shot of Pam walking up to the Sawyer house. And this one seems like it's maybe a little less epic or more understated than some of the other scenes from the movie. But there is just something about this dolly shot that goes from under the swing she's on and follows her as she walks up to the house. It's such a beautiful shot. Toby Hooper just killed it with the artistic vision of this movie. And the execution of this shot is one of, if not the most memorable visual elements of the movie. And we get it low from underneath the house. So the house looks very large and imposing, but everything is so beautiful with the bright Texas sun and Pam just looks so vulnerable with her outfit. I mean, the shirt she's wearing from the back, you just see her exposed back and her teeny tiny little shorts that she has on. So she just looks very exposed and vulnerable while she approaches this looming house. And earlier we did see her boyfriend, uh, Kirk, I believe his name is. We see him enter the house and Leatherface just cracks him on the head with that sledgehammer. <laughs> The 
So we know what's waiting inside. We don't know all the horrors exactly, but we know that Leatherface is there with a hammer, um, which is terrifying. But Pam does not know that at this point. And she is walking up to the house very slowly. This is another scene where pacing is so important because we're just waiting with anxiety to see what happens. So, you know, she approaches the door and she's trying to see what's going on. And Leatherface just pops out and grabs her. And we get that sight of her kicking and flailing just her tiny body as the huge Gunnar Hansen who plays Leatherface just grabs her with ease and drags her into the house. And it's just an expertly shot scene. So memorable, just so artistic. And just knowing what the cast and crew went through shooting that movie, it truly was a labor of love. And I just don't think the people at the time really realized what an artistic achievement the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was. I think that they were taken in by the name and the whole, you know, it's a true story thing and the gross aspects of it, which obviously there are gross aspects of it, but it's honestly a work of art. And now everybody always cites it as one of the best horror movies of all time and for good reason. So, I mean, that's why it's going to remain in my top favorite horror movies of all time. But this scene in particular just always stands out to me. So, of course, I had to include it on my list. Number three is from American Psycho. Again, this is another one of my favorite horror movies of all time. And again, another movie with a lot of iconic scenes. But if you know the movie, this is another one where you can probably guess the scene I'm going to talk about. And that is the hip to be square scene. You like Huey Lewis in the news? Yeah, they're okay. This scene, I think, encapsulates perfectly the tone and the mood of the movie as a whole. We get a perfect amount of comedy and horror combined in this scene. And Christian Bale as Patrick Bateman, I mean, come on. It's one of the best horror performances of all time, in my opinion. He just kills every single second of this movie. I, uh, <laughs> I just have to kill a lot of people. And when we see him talking about <laughs> the Huey Lewis album and he's going on and on about the facts of the album and just the irony of having the song Hip to be Square playing because that song is talking about how it's like, I used to be a renegade, I used to fool around, and now he's kind of become this clean cut guy wearing business suits and everything. So that is the lifestyle that Patrick Bateman is trying to live in, but he's fighting this renegade part of himself that wants to go crazy and break free from societal norms and kill a bunch of people. And you know, I mean, it's just this juxtaposition of him fighting his killer impulses and then just letting go of them at the same time. So Paul Allen, who is played by Jared Leto, is just not paying attention at all. And Patrick is just moonwalking all over the place, <laughs> being really goofy. But we see him get this axe and it's just the perfect exemplification of him as a character because it's this implement of torture and this thing that can harm people but it's so shiny and it's so beautiful you kind of get lulled in by its looks and that's what happens with Patrick is he's a very beautiful very clean cut person but he can do some really terrible things so you know we see him grab the axe and when he says hey Paul hey Paul And then he just flips and takes that axe to Paul's head. And he brings back Dorcia, which is the restaurant that he can never get into, that Paul always brags about getting into Dorcia. We should have gone to Dorcia. I could have gotten us a table. Dorcia. Um, yes, I know it's a little late, but is it possible to reserve a table for two at 8 or 8.30, perhaps? <laughs> And so he has to bring that up while he's killing Paul. And it's just so funny and so well done. But also, it's really horrific. Like, it's very pre-planned. It's very much... Patrick just getting all of his rage out in this scene and getting splattered with all the blood. Yeah, Mary Heron, the director, just does an amazing job with it. I mean, the whole film is so good and it's got that black comedy aspect to it and all of the social commentary integrated into the film just forever it will be one of my favorites and I will never be able to listen to the song Hip to be Square without thinking of this scene. So that is why it made it on my list. 
Number two is from The Silence of the Lambs. This is a movie that I can watch over and over again. I never get tired of Silence of the Lambs. It is one of my favorites. And that is a huge testament to Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter and Jodie Foster as Clarice Starling. Those two just balance each other out perfectly. They do an amazing job with their acting and they really play off each other so well. And it was Oscar worthy for a good reason. It's just an incredible movie that has a huge rewatchability factor. So this is one that I go back to all the time. And the scene from this movie that gets me every single time is the scene where Hannibal Lecter escapes. And this is where he has killed the police officers. That scene in and of itself where, you know, he basically eats the guy's tongue and all of that. That scene is so epic. And I mean, they kind of tie into each other. You know, it's it's one big sequence, but we get that intense scene. And then we get the police coming in and trying to figure out what's going on. And when they look up in the elevator and they see the blood dripping down and they're not sure what's happening. And we get the cuts to the ambulance where, who we think is one of the police officers that Hannibal attacked earlier. He's in the ambulance and his face is all messed up but he's still breathing and the EMS workers are like, it's going to be okay. You're going to make it. And we cut back to the police officers in the elevator and someone is stuffed up into the compartment above the elevator and they're dead. And so we're like, wait, who was that? And then we get the reveal of Hannibal Lecter peeling that face off in the ambulance. Good. Pressure is 130 over 90. 90. Yeah, that's right, 90. Uh, pulse 84 running and, uh, and the uh, patient is on 10 liters of oxygen. And you realize, oh my god, he staged it to look like he was the police officer who was injured so that he could escape. And then he just wreaks havoc in this ambulance, and we know at this point Hannibal has escaped. He has outsmarted everyone, and he is going to be on the loose again. And just the intelligence and the wit of Hannibal Lecter is so compelling through the whole film, and we know he is smarter than everybody in the room. We know that if he gets the opportunity he is going to escape and he is looking at every turn for opportunities that he can take in order for him to get out of there and it's only a matter of time before he does and it culminates in this scene which just the editing of going back and forth from the elevator to the ambulance is so good and it really builds the tension and then we're thinking what does this mean for Clarice what's going to happen when she finds out that Hannibal has escaped they found the ambulance in a parking garage at Memphis airport crew was dead. That whole third act of the movie is honestly probably the most perfect third act of a horror movie that I can think of. Just so well executed. I honestly, I have no notes for the whole movie. No notes. No notes. No notes. I, I think it is probably a perfect film. If there is such a thing as a perfect film, Silence of the Lambs is it. I just love it so much. And that scene is always the part where it gets my heart racing. It gets me even more excited about the story. So that is why it is number two on my list. I do wish we could chat longer, but I'm having an old friend for dinner. And last but not least, my number one favorite horror movie moment of all time is from A Nightmare on Elm Street. The original, of course, we are not talking about that absolute garbage of a remake. <laughs> Sorry if you like the remake, I just, I really, really can't with that movie. But anyway, this is again another one where we have so many moments to choose from. But the scene that always really sticks out to me is Tina in the body bag in the school. So of course the beauty of An Nightmare on Elm Street is not knowing when certain things are dreams, what's happening, what's real, what's not. And this is one where we've got Nancy in school and she drifts off to sleep. On streets. As stars with trains of fire and dude. And she has this dream of her best friend Tina, who we see get killed earlier in the film, of course. Her death scene is so epic, and I honestly debated between that and this scene, but I mean, they're both so good. But this one, for some reason, just the imagery of her in that body bag really sticks out to me. And it just really encapsulates the dream quality of the whole movie, and it just really feels like a nightmare. And we get Nancy seeing her in the hallway, where she gets up out of her desk, and she looks around, and you see Tina in this bloody body bag. Tina? 
Just the imagery is so recognizable. When you see that, you know exactly what it's from. I actually uh, dressed up as Tina in the body bag for, um, it wasn't Halloween, it was actually a horror themed drag brunch. So I, I'll put a picture here so you guys can see it, but I just used a garment cover thing as a body bag and, you know, red face paint and all of that for the blood. And yeah, it was so much fun to put together, but. But I digress. Uh we get Tina in the hallway. She's saying Nancy's name. It's so creepy. And she's laying on the ground and then you see her legs lifted up by an invisible force. We don't see what's happening. And when her arm flops back and it makes that like thud noise. Oh, that part is so creepy. And then of course she just gets dragged down the hall and we get that trail of blood behind her. Just such a visually stunning and scary and memorable scene. And that one is just always going to stick in my mind. The magic of that movie I just think can't be recaptured. What Wes Craven did with the first Nightmare on Elm Street is just unmatched. And a large part of that is all of the amazing practical effects that happen in the movie. And this is is one of those scenes that I think exemplifies the amazing practical effects, the incredible acting by our lead Heather Langenkamp, and the frightening kind of magic of these dream sequences. So for all of those reasons, that's why it is my number one favorite horror movie moment. The king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. So yeah, everybody, that's my list, my list of my 10 favorite horror movie moments. Let me know in the comments what some of your favorite horror movie moments are. If any of yours are the same as mine, I would love to know. But I would just also like to know in general which ones really stick out to you and are the most memorable for you. So please comment those below. I also wanted to say that I surpassed 500 subscribers, which means that I have access to my community tab now, which is awesome. That means I can make posts, I can post pictures, and polls and just talk to you all more, just engage with you more on YouTube. So I'm super stoked about that. So keep an eye out for future community posts from me. I'm sure I'll be posting some questions about what you guys wanna see in future videos or just letting you know about things that I'm currently working on just to keep you all up to date on upcoming content and stuff like that. So super stoked about that. And I think my next video is going to be Valentine's Day related. I am planning a video for 14 days of heartbreak horror is what I'm going to call it. And it's going to be one movie that is either Valentine's Day themed or just kind of like a horror romance or sort of like unrequited love. Any themes like that that kind of relate to love and Valentine's Day for the two weeks leading up to Valentine's Day. So February 1st through 14th. So I'm really excited about that. I just really love Valentine's Day. I love the aesthetic and the hearts and the pinks and the reds and everything about it. So I'm very excited for that. So please keep an eye out. That should be out on February 1st is what I'm planning. So yeah, I've got some exciting stuff coming up. As always, I wanna thank everyone for watching. You guys are awesome. You're the reason that I was able to make it past 500 subscribers. So thank you all so much for your support. It means the world to me. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And let's just hang out on here. Let's talk about horror movies, have some fun. Yeah, thank you everyone again for watching. I hope you all have an amazing day and we'll talk horror next time. Bye.